Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce Tuan Tran as our speaker this morning for Grand Rounds. Um, Tuan received his undergraduate degree from the University of Florida and his graduate and medical degrees from Emory. He then did his residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, a clinical fellowship at the NIH, and then a postdoctoral fellowship at the NIH with Peter Crompton. And he's now an assistant professor at Indiana University School of Medicine, where he holds um, multiple academic appointments and is also a staff physician in infectious disease. Tuan has a impressive publication record and has already achieved um, substantial NIH funding. And his laboratory is focused on studying both natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity to malaria. And what has struck me about his work is his ability to really powerfully use um, systems biology approaches to identify pathways and even individual markers that can predict susceptibility or protection from disease. And um, I think he's a thoughtful physician scientist and I always enjoy talking with him and I'm looking forward to hearing the latest from his group. So thank you for being here, Tuan, and take it away. Thanks, Sarah, for the generous introduction. Um, um, it's a pleasure to um, come talk to uh, at Grand Rounds at the Department of Laboratory Medicine. Um, and uh, uh, today I'll be uh, giving you a little bit of an update on um, uh, the strategies to uh, prevent malaria infections, um, especially in a field. Um, and so, and then I'll uh, show some of my, my our own work uh, at Indiana University. Um, and so hopefully the background that I provide will give you a little bit of uh, continuing medic medical education, um, but also uh, give you context uh, for our own work. So before we begin, I have no relevant financial dis relationships to disclose. Um, I would not discuss any off-label use or investigation use um, in this presentation. So the learning objectives is to review the life cycle of human malaria, learn about the current strategies to prevent uh, plasmodium cipro infections, and to learn about natural immunity against malaria infection. So malaria uh, is still a global health threat um, with over 240 million cases in 2020. Uh, 629,000 deaths, um, and um, both numbers are up, um, you know, primarily due to, um, excuse me, um, primarily uh, due to, you know, the, the health care uh, crisis uh, uh, with COVID. Um, and so, you know, you probably heard about um, emerging malaria drug resistance as well. Um, as uh, it's appeared in uh, African countries um, in scientific journals in the last year. And this has um, made it to uh, the, the, the mainstream medium. And um, all this beneath the background of the COVID pandemic. So it's really uh, stressed the healthcare system. Um, and needless to say that the malaria and emerging, uh, and emerging resistance in malaria has increased the urgency for uh, better strategies to prevent malaria. And so to understand the strategy for targeting a malaria parasite, um, we have to review the plasmodium life cycle. Um, uh, for, for those of you who, who don't know, it would be uh, uh, good to you know, understand the different stages of the parasite within the human host uh, so we can better understand the strategies. Um, so infection begins when a mosquito bite releases sporozoites into the bloodstream. Uh, of the vertebrate host, and these, um, excuse me, just have my timing going. Um, so it enters the bloodstream of the vertebrate host and subsequently infects the, uh, the liver cell. And uh, this, this process is actually clinically silent and it doesn't, uh, the host doesn't feel the symptoms of malaria until the blood stage begins. And this begins when uh, the parasite, after multiplying, multiplying the liver cell, bursts into the, uh, into the blood as these merozoites, each of which can infect 
uh, red blood cells. Within a red blood cell, uh, in the initial ring stage, um, it, it can either uh, develop into um, the sexual stages or gametocytes, or um, more likely it's going to uh, develop within the, the red blood cell, multiply um, uh, and develop into schizons, and the schizons then burst, releasing daughter merozoites, each of which can, can actually infect another red blood cell. And so um, to target malaria, we can either try to uh, target the pre erythrocytic or hepatic uh, stage, um, the blood stage, or uh, the gametocytes um, or sexual stage. And so this talk will focus on um, uh, targets that, um, that aim to prevent infection um, in the pre erythrocytic stage. So I'll talk about pre erythrocytic vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. And so um, the sporozoite um, is the infectious form of the uh, parasite, so the liver infectious form. So this is, like, uh, like I mentioned, what is um, injected into the human host by the mosquito. Um, and the major antigenic determinant on the surface of the sporozoite is the circumsporozoite protein. Um, and um, one of the earliest strategies to uh, try to um, make a malaria vaccine uh, was a strategy using irradiated sporozoites. And this was work done in the late 1960s by Ruth Musenzweig, whereby um, she irradiated um, uh, sporozoites um, using gamma radiation and then inject these into AJ mice. Um, and then two weeks later, challenge them with fully infectious um, uh, sporozoites. Um, and so this conferred protection uh, from parasitemia. Um, and uh, in the 1970s, uh, this strategy was applied in humans, um, uh, whereby there was a series of studies that's done uh, showing that um, both irradiated uh, P. falciparum P. vivax sporozoites um, uh, were successful in confirmed protection um, after immunization. Um, of course, um, it, the strategy that was employed before was using um, infectious mosquito bites or, or um, using irradiated mosquitoes um, to confer this protection. And so the strategy is a very practical um, and uh, about a couple of decades ago, um, uh, Steve Hoffman uh, started a company called Scenaria uh, to try to develop a purified cryopreserved radiation attenuated uh, sporozoic vaccine. And uh, this was later shown uh, to be uh, protective against um, uh, challenge um, uh, if delivered intravenously. So uh, there, a study was try shown trying to figure out if it was can be done intradermally or IM. Um, but the key is to if you deliver IV, um, you'll deliver enough sporozoids to deliver uh, to generate an immune response. Um, and so uh, this protection uh, can be durable, uh, at least in uh, naive U.S. volunteers. Um, and other strategies using whole sporozoic vaccines include uh, what's called chemoprophylaxis vaccination. So this is immunization using infectious sporozoids under cover of animal areas. Um, and so this approach is essentially uh, uh, administer chloroquine or another anti-malaria uh, to the individual and then expose that individual to uh, fully infectious mosquito bites. And so what happens is that uh, uh, the, uh, the person actually becomes infected and parasitemic, uh, but never becomes symptomatic because uh, of the chloroquine cover. And so um, within uh, uh, days after um, the infectious bite, the parasitemia essentially um, resolves on its own. And then each subsequent immunization, there's less breakthrough. Uh, and so uh, weeks later after your challenge with a, a fully infectious without chloroquine uh, uh, cover, you're protected. Um, and this has been applied um, using uh, the purified um, sporozoites. And so instead of having to uh, deliver the sporozoites via mosquito bites, you can actually use this purified um, sporozoite uh, 
uh, and fully infectious sporozoites and deliver to uh, individuals who are under cover of either chloroquine or uh, paramethamine and, and can fear uh, sterile hepatic immunity. Um, there is another approach um, using genetically attenuated rest of sporozoites. Um, um, and uh, some of this work has been done by Stefan Kapi. And um, what this strategy is involved is deleting specific genes um, within the parasite. And so that um, this, this sporozoic can actually infect the liver, uh, but has uh, arrested development within the hepatocyte. Um, and this, this strategy allows uh, the immune system to see the full range of um, antigens within the sporozoite to develop an appropriate immune response. Um, and this kind of goes to the strategy of, of how these spor whole sporozoite uh, vaccination works. Um, the key is, is that um, uh, the sporozoite has to infect the hepatocyte develop with uh, up to, to a certain point um, develop the necessary uh, response so that the proper antigens can be presented to CD8 T cells. Um, and this uh, CD8 T cells um, uh, essentially uh, um, result in memory. And so when a person is subsequently challenged, uh, uh, the memory CD8 uh, T cells can actually um, uh, target the tissue and um, um, prevent uh, subsequent infections. Um, and so uh, you might ask, what about um, the antibody approaches? So, um, well, uh, the circumsporozoic protein um, has been utilized in a recombinant antigen strategy. And so this is the structure of the circumsporozoic protein. And so this is a, of a, a single peptide, uh, a central uh, repeat region uh, consists of um, NANP and then uh, there is a C terminal region that has uh, uh, T cell um, epitopes. And so this was this, this um, uh, C terminus was uh, was used uh, to develop a vaccine along with this immunodominant B cell epitope. Um, and so this region of CSP was put into the, what's called the RTSS vaccine. Um, and this is the uh, first and only malaria, licensed malaria vaccine. It is fused to a hepatitis B surface antigen um, and um, when expressed uh, alongside with uh, uh, hepatitis B surface antigen alone, it forms a virus-like particle. Um, and so uh, the, the main um, uh, immune response against this is a uh, B cell response that generates uh, antibodies that are correlated with protection. And so this, uh, essentially shows that um, in protected individuals, you get a high CSP response after immunization with RTSS. Um, it also generates uh, CSP specific uh, CD4 T cell response, but does not generate any CD uh, responses. And so this um, vaccine uh, was trialed in African infants in a large phase three trial multi-site. Um, and uh, it conferred about 30% um, vaccine efficacy um, protection against uh, clinical malaria episodes um, in the target population of African infants uh, and uh, uh, does not confer durable uh, protection, so it does require a, a booster dose at about one year. Um, but despite uh, the, the modest efficacy, uh, because of the absolute reduction in numbers of uh, malaria cases, uh, the WHO uh, recommended uh, this vaccine for children at risk um, just last year. Um, and so this, uh, like I mentioned, is the uh, first and only a, a approved uh, malaria vaccine to date. Um, so this strategy has been improved upon. So uh, a group at Oxford led by Adrian Hill has uh, um, modified the RTSS um, uh, and essentially changed the stoichiometry so that um, the virus-like particle has um, essentially a one-to-one stoichiometry -one, um, to this hepatitis B surface energy, having more CSP epitopes um, presumably will um, uh, make it more uh, immunogenic and produce a more directed antibody response against um, the malaria uh, antigen versus uh, hepatitis B. And so uh, in a phase 2B 
um, uh, trial done in uh, Burkina Af uh, Faso in uh, infants. Uh, there was 440, 450 infants in a one to one to one randomization. Um, essentially, uh, two doses of uh, R21 and each having different um, uh, concentrations of the adjuvant matrix M. Um, and it was shown to be 74 to 75 or 77% effective. Uh, in children at six months. Um, uh, it's, not, it's noted that it was a um, report that was uh, effective at 12 months, but um, since this is an area of seasonal malaria, um, those six months are during the dry season, so there's hardly any transmission. Um, and so now I kind of go back to uh, the um, um, radiation attenuated spores of the white uh, vaccine because um, uh, is in these um, vaccine studies done at the NIH, um, uh, as I mentioned, the SPZ vaccine um, mediates most of its protection through CD8 T cells, but it does, um, uh, uh, it, it does um, uh, elicit an antibody response. And so uh, in the protected, one of the protected individuals uh, in this, these VRC studies uh, done at the NIH, um, they were able to isolate um, uh, B cells that produce uh, CSP and clone out monoclonal antibodies um, that potentially have um, antisporozoid activity. And so one of those um, monoclonal antibodies that was uh, extracted from uh, these B cells of these protected individuals um, targeted um, the junctional epitope of CSP shown here. Um, uh, one in particular, CIS-43, uh, was uh, potent in pre um, preventing infection um, uh, in uh, a mouse model, and later it was extended to you know, a human study. Um, and as you can see here, um, a modified form of CIS-43, called CIS-43S, um, uh, protected nine out of nine individuals to uh, uh, control human malaria infection um, uh, up to 21 days. Um, and uh, this, this um, monoclonal antibody has since been modified, um, or excuse me, there is an, a next generation monoclonal that was um, essentially discovered that had uh, more potency um, uh, and better protects uh, relative to CIS-43. Um, so this L9 preferentially bounds um, a certain NP and V motifs associated with the NV and EP minor repeats of CSP. And then the LS mutations in the FC heavy carry prolonged serum half life. And so this um, uh, monoclonal antibody is currently being trialed in Malian children. Um, it work done by um, Peter Crompton and um, Bob Cedar. So um, the question. Um, our group has is this, is there natural immunity to PFOS serpent infection? And so um, how, how does it relate to uh, what I just uh, talked about? Well, I was trying to set up um, uh, for, for our studies and showing that uh, there are strategies looking, targeting CSP and it uh, both relates to antibodies. Um, but one of the things that we observed is that, um, you know, in the, the youngest uh, infants, um, maternal antibodies appear to play some role in conferring immunity, um, but there's le very little evidence that they confer long lasting sterile protection. And so in children um, older than six months to about two years, um, uh, what is actually protecting these individuals or these, these uh, little children that they don't have the maternal antibodies to protect them and they haven't yet developed the adaptive responses. Um, uh, these young children still have less risk of PFOS serpent um, infection than would otherwise be predicted based on their entomological inoculation rates. And so um, you can see here from this uh, very old tape, uh, this very old study done in the 1960s, is that um, even though the theoretical parasite rate is, you know, increases with age, um, the actual um, uh, infections in these children are a lot lower than what otherwise would be expected. Um, 
And so uh, what are the reasons for this? You know, there, there's some evidence that there's heterogeneous biting by infectious mosquitoes with preference, preference for older individuals that is proportion of body surface area. So that might be obvious. Um, there's adaptive immunity against blood stage infections that would rapidly clear um, primary merozoites from emerging hepatocytes. That is a possibility, although it is noted that these are very young infants, so it will take time for that to happen. Um, and then lastly, robust innate immunity can absorb a fraction of in in incoming infections at the pre erythrocytic stage. And so I think one of the things that's um, important to understand is that these children are bombarded with infectious mosquito bite, bites on a daily basis. And so there are some areas where um, they have at least one infectious mosquito bite every day. Um, and so why do we only see that these, these uh, children only come in with, uh, you know, just a, a few um, malaria episodes per year? Um, and so, um, one observation that we made in a, a study when I was at the NH um, done in um, uh, 2011 was that um, if you look at the cumulus, uh, cumulative incidence of infection. So this is actually uh, a reverse Kaplan-Meier plot. Um, the proportion of um, parasitemic uh, individuals um, obviously goes up as the uh, as the malaria season starts. Um, but what, one observation that we noted was that in the, the youngest children, there was a significant fraction that remained uninfected uh, throughout the malaria season, and so. Uh, we actually wondered why was that happening? Could it be something that's related to uh, behavioral? Uh, uh, you know, the, the mothers of these young children uh, do in fact um, uh, um, have their, their youngest children sleep on their bed nets more often. Uh, they often swallow them um, to prevent mosquito bites. And so uh, this was uh, a potential um, possibility that um, it's, it has nothing to do with um, the immunology. Um, it has everything to do with behavior. Um, unfortunately, that study, we, we weren't able to tease out because we only found this after fact and it was hard to retrospectively figure out uh, if that was true uh, of the behavioral changes. Um, and so we were left to wonder why um, these youngest children seem to have less infections. Um, Around that time, uh, Patrick Duffy's group also uh, made an observation that they were seeing the, this malaria-resistant phenotype uh, in a uh, birth cohort in ten Tanzania, and that the malaria-resistant phenotype had greater inflammatory cytokines than susceptible, especially I1 beta um, uh, at birth. Um, and so we formally uh, tried to address this and, so, and uh, Oh, among the, the individuals that were um, had ne never been infected, we looked closely at the, the number of um, uh, times we surveyed. So this, in the year 2011, we did intensive malaria surveillance by, by which we not only surveyed them for um, uh, sick visits in that, you know, every time the, uh, the child or the mother brings a child in um, with uh, fully uh, fully clinical episode, fever, chills, et cetera. Uh, we also um, collected blood samples from them every two weeks. We were able to do retrospective PCR analysis to figure out uh, at what point during this malaria season they became infected and at what point they became febrile. And you can see here that uh, um, many of the individuals became parasitemic as noted by um, the, uh, the red squares. Um, but there, there was a subset that remained um, uh, PCR negative throughout, despite having um, around cute two weeks um, uh, PCR surveillance. Um, and so, amongst these, uh, so, so these twelve kids actually had um, uh, sufficient um, um, surveyed PCR blood samples that we were able to confidently say that um, they remain uh, PCR negative. Um, excuse me. Um, among these kids, we, we looked at their antibody responses before and after malaria season, and we identified uh, children who actually had 
uh, a boost in the, the malaria specific antibody response using a protein array. And, and amongst these eight parasitic children, there were nine kids that showed um, uh, boosting about 10% of their malaria antigens, um, both to preerythrocytic stage and blood stage, which um, suggests that these children uh, remained TCR negative despite actually either being exposed or being infected with the parasite. And so we investigated these children further um, uh, using uh, whole blood RNA seq and also site seq. Um, and uh, if you compare the uh, children who were remained um, a aparasitemic throughout the season with uh, matched controls, so matched by age and um, gender, uh, to those who remained uh, who who became positive, you'll see that the aparasitemic kids had enrichment in TNF signaling also in uh, monocyte and B cell signatures. And um, fortunately we had PBMCs from these children at baseline. So this is actually before the malaria season starts um, and we're able to do um, site seq which is um, single cell uh, uh, RNA seq, um, but also in using surface markers uh, so that you can identify them using surface um, uh, antigens. Um, we also observed that, that we were able to see enrichment in um, the monocyte subsets um, in the uh, individuals who were never parasitic versus parasitic. So each of these plots represents um, two children um, and they're normalized for the total amount of cells. Um, and this is a work done by Priscilla Halla, who we re recently recruited to our group. Um, and so, um, with that in mind, um, uh, I'll, I'll discuss um, some of our work that we did uh, for the KSPZ vaccine in Kenya. And this will, I'll come back to that, uh, that finding uh, that I just showed you regarding the APA or Sedatima kids. But um, um, the NIH, uh, CDC, and Camry conducted a clinical trial of the um, PFSBZ vaccine. So this radiation attenuated spores of vaccine that I, I talked about that was shown to work in um, uh, US naive volunteers. Um, but one of the problems that is like vaccines that work in naive, um, malaria naive individuals often do not work in the field. So this was a, a sort of a proof of concept study to see if the vaccine can actually work in um, the target population of African infants. And so part one of the study had shown that um, uh, uh, it was a, a dose escalate, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a study to see if the SBZ vaccine was safe and effective. Um, but the part two of the study was um, geared towards actually finding if there was actually statistical protection. Um, and so this was uh, a double blind RCT with four arms, the saline um, placebo control, and there's three doses of SBZ, um, 4.5 times 10 to the fifth, uh, 900,000 and 1.8 million, what's called a high dose. And so um, this trial showed that the vaccine did not confer durable protection at the primary endpoints of uh, 12 months, uh, but there was protection from first team a short term in the high dose group at three months. Um, and um, we took advantage of this um, uh, and did a systems analysis of uh, the SBC vaccine in the uh, Kenyan infants. And the way we did this was, um, as you can see, the vaccine strategy is uh, there's three doses um, every eight weeks. Um, uh, and we, we were able to get blood uh, from these children at the pre-immunization uh, baseline, also two weeks after the last dose. Um, we collected the blood for whole blood RNA-seq, um, plasma for antibodies, um, some flow cytometry, and some plasma cytokines. And the goal was to um, uh, figure out, you know, why the, the vaccine didn't work as well, um, given that we had a substantial proportion of uh, unprotected individuals that we could actually um, uh, compare it with the protected individuals. Um, and so the subset with RNA available for analysis um, uh, is shown here. And you can see that um, our, 
we primarily concentrate on the high dose uh, group, being that that was the, the most immunogenic vaccine dose and also conferred the most protection or statistically uh, significant protection at three months. And um, not to go into the details, but um, we did um, whole blood RNA-seq at baseline um, and uh, gene set enrichment analysis um, uh, for samples comparing protected, which is um, shown in the red and not protected shown in the uh, blue, um, uh, between all four dose groups um, and then looked at uh, different blood transcription modules. And what's in red is actually enriched and protected, which is blue is enriched and not protected. So protected means that they did not demonstrate any parasitemic episodes within the three months to follow up and uh, not protected means that there was at least one. And as you can see here, um, uh, well, the curious observation that we saw was that um, there was a reciprocal um, a signature between placebo and high dose groups uh, for monocytes, DC activation. Uh, so the, essentially the myeloid um, cells um, in that in the placebo uh, uh, group, uh, it was the protected kids that had enrichment in monocytes, whereas in the uh, vaccine group, um, it was the non-protected kids uh, that had enrichment. Um, and so um, it, essentially our hypothesis was that innate um, uh, immune activation um, potentially uh, uh, can prevent natural infection, but also could be detrimental for this um, uh, purified crappers or radiation tendroid uh, sporozoid. Um, and I, I don't show the signatures here, but there were innate um, uh, inflammatory pathways that were um, enriched. Um, we were also curious to look at um, the, uh, whether or not um, certain signatures correlated with a higher antibody response. And we took advantage here of um, the antibody responses in the high dose group. Um, what is shown here is essentially the, the log flow change over of the post-vaccination antibody levels against CSP uh, compared to the baseline. And what we saw was that we, there was a bimodal response in uh, the individuals who got the high dose of the SPZ vaccine. Um, and this, uh, uh, we, we took advantage of this and we compared um, the, uh, the transcriptome of those kids who had a high CSP specific IgG response to the vaccine and those who had a low CSP IgG response. And what we showed was that um, the higher responders had enrichment in um, monocytes in uh, innate inflammatory signatures relative to the lower responders. And so this um, uh, supports uh, work done by others showing that uh, innate inflammation actually promotes um, antibody responses in other vaccine um, uh, platforms. Um, um, we looked at this using another approach, using um, upstream regulated analysis, and um, uh, sort of corroborated what we did with the gene set enrichment analysis, and that um, in a high dose group, those individuals who are not protected, shown in blue, had enrichment in um, uh, these innate signaling pathways, um, so LPS interferons, um, also no no. Um, uh, conversely, um, in the placebo group, there was uh, enrichment, so not as strong uh, um, as shown by the book, the kind of plot, but um, the same innate signatures um, targeting um, interferon pathways and LPS pathways were shown enriched in the protected individuals. And so we went back and um, to the Malian data. So this is just prep. Um, SPZ study was done in Kenyan infants. And we went back to the, the young Mali kids who were about one to two years old. And what we saw was there were some similarities across these two different studies and that we see um, that there was enrichment of um, TNF signaling via NF kappa B and also monocyte signatures um, in those kids who remain um, P-thus serpent negative versus those who uh, became p uh, positive 
um, during the respective um, follow-up periods of six months for Hmong kids and three months for the Kenyan kids. Um, and so what this um, it implicates inflammation of monocytes and short terminate protection against PFOS serpent infection. Um, so what we want to do further is try to uh, uh, determine potentially the mechanism of this, if, you know, of this process and whether or not it requires antibodies or, or not um, um, mediated through FC receptors on monocytes. Um, and so it, uh, we're pretty excited about this work because it, it could partially explain why uh, these young infants um, tend to have uh, less infections than what would otherwise be expected um, given the burden on disease and, and the areas that they live in. Um, so uh, to summarize, um, uh, targeting pre arrestorcytic stages can prevent infection and thus malaria disease and transmission. Um, strategies that in, uh, involve whole sporozoite approaches that elicit CD8 T cell and CSP specific antibody responses. So those approaches would be radiation attenuated sporozoites, um, uh, chemoprophylaxis uh, vaccination, uh, and also genetically attenuated or genetically arrested sporozoites. Um, there's recombinant CSP based antigens that elicit CSP specific antibodies. So the RTSS vaccine, the first and only um, approved malaria uh, vaccine to date, followed by the next generation um, uh, R21. Um, um, and then uh, I didn't mention this, but there, there are um, potential uh, blood stage vaccine candidates um, that uh, could eventually, especially when combined with other strategies, confer um, uh, uh, protection against infection. Um, and then uh, we, we also discussed potent IgG monoclonal antibodies that target junctional epitope um, against uh, CSP. Um, and um, there's mentioned that there's always a discussion regarding this strategy um, of how, uh, uh, how practical it is to deploy this in, uh, you know, in, in Africa when the price of monoclons are fairly still expensive. Um, I think the goal um, mainly is to and use it as a proof of concept, but then eventually uh, deploy it to either travelers or people who are um, stationed in um, malaria endemic uh, countries for a short time period. Um, and then um, uh, as costs go down or if there's more funding for it, uh, strategically use it, um, especially in areas of seasonal malaria transmission. Um, so if you can prolong effect of the antibodies um, uh, oh, to six months during the malaria season, then you have an uh, entire population covered uh, if you're able to uh, manufacture and deliver um, the monoclonal antibodies. And then lastly, um, we, we discussed natural immunity to malaria infection in youngest children. Um, it showed a little bit of preliminary evidence um, that innate immune activation of monocytes might play a role in the strategy. Um, with that, um, I'd just like to thank um, uh, study participants in Kenya and Mali, um, members of my lab, so Jyoti Bardwaj, um, did a lot of the um, work with the monocytes, Lita St. Paul did the transcriptomics, um, and then uh, uh, Bob Cedar, uh, um, Tina Oniko, and Simon Kiriaku, uh, Laura Steinhardt kind of led the KSPZ uh, one vaccine. Um, and with that, uh, I also thank my funders. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm Dr. Vanessa Dayton. I'm a hematopathologist at the University of Minnesota. Um, it, I have two questions, actually. I want to know, uh, when do you foresee uh, monoclonal antibodies as being available uh, widespread for US travelers traveling to endemic areas? Um, I have to say that I think what they're, uh, the L9LS is currently, ha has been trialed in US volunteers. Um, and I don't know the, the results of that data, but I think that's going to, um, be developed and get try to get FDA approval. I don't know how long the process is, but 
um, I would probably estimate within you know a year or two we'll start seeing some some action. But I, I they just started the the study in Africa. Um, I think this month. So. Um, uh, in African children, but I, I think the approval process, given um, the evidence, it's it's pretty strong that this works. So, and my question for you is: Have you been vaccinated? Have uh, and if so, with which vaccine? And um, if not, what do you use as prophylaxis? I I uh, um, have been in, uh, engaged in um, uh, international medicine as a pathologist for the last several years, traveling to develop developing countries to assist them with laboratory development in hematology. And um, I am uh, I really dislike uh, <laughs> um, uh, all of the, the uh, options, the chloroquine mm-hmm. options, um, so. Uh, I, I, I agree with your sentence. So uh, um, having worked in malaria in every country since I grew, being a grad student, I've tried every um, prophylaxis. So doxycycline, malarone, methylcholine, when um, I ended up using malarone because, you know, Mefloquine, um basically made, uh, made me have um, locked-in syndrome. I could not sleep. Um, doxycycline, IgA distress. But I actually used malarone for a time. And um, 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 it's funny that you mentioned it. So I was using malarone in Kenya a couple years ago. Um, like, uh, actually had malaria while I was on it. And so um, uh, I don't know if it was because of, you know, um, pharmacokinetics or, um, or resistance. Um, and I tried to answer a question. So it's actually a fairly funny story. So I, I, I got malaria while on malarone and I diagnosed myself um, and uh, uh, got my lab to get me the proper malaria score and after I diagnosed myself. Um, and I kept, I did a, kept the blood spots with the intention to actually uh, do sequencing to figure out if I had a resistant parasite. Um, but when I was trying to bring the, my own blood spot back to uh, the U.S., I forgot to declare it, and then, so they actually um, um, confiscated it. Um, and uh, I was never able to figure out uh, the reason why I developed malaria while on malarin. So. Um, but there has been reports of malarone resistance. So, uh, are you? Do you anticipate that you will become? You will get vaccinated, and if so, which of the vaccines do you think um, you would choose for yourself at this point? Um, it would depend on how long I'm there. But if the monoclonal is available, I would, um, you know, in, in the future, I would probably or offer prefer that. You would prefer to prophylax with the monoclonal as opposed to being actually vaccinated, even with. Um, the vaccine you've been working on? So uh, the, because the, the, the efficacy of the current vaccine is not, um, so the, the only approved vaccine, RTSS, um, is not super effective, right? So um, uh, the strategy in terms of vaccinated for travelers um, is, a, I would say it would be a little risky. Um, and what's been shown with RTSS is that it's most protective against um, uh, parasites that are closely related to the vaccine strain. Um, and so there is a risk there. Um, um, but that would be, yeah, I think I would lean towards the monoclonal if it's valid, pending, pending the results of these studies uh, done in endemic countries, uh, given the diversity of the parasite. Thank you very much. Okay, and Dr. Daly, please. Yeah, so Dr. Tran, very nice. Thank you very much for that uh, discussion. I'm one of those people who actually grew up with malaria. So, uh, it's, you know, as a child, it was almost like uh, comparing notes. I say, oh, you had malaria, yours was not as bad as mine. So we, we sang a lot about it. Now, I'm, I'm interested about your monocyte data. I think that's quite uh, exciting. And I see that you worked only in children. So my first question is the first chart that you showed was just about 25% of the children that didn't have the malaria and were enriched for the monocytes. So do you know why there's that differential enrichment for monocytes among the children? And the second question is how robust or how long lasting is this? Is this something that stayed with that particular court? Do they always have that enrichment? <laughs> 
And one more question, and uh, I'll keep quiet. Uh, talking about adults, if, like you just said, so when expatriates who didn't grow up in malaria environment, when they travel to Africa and develop malaria, it tends to be way more severe than in adults who you know, grew up in the areas and still develop malaria. Do we know what's the difference between, I mean, I, I'm sure it's part of the uh, natural immunity that you were talking about, but do you know what is the mechanism for that kind of severity differential between native uh, Africans and uh, expatriates? Yes, um, I'll go with your first question first um, regarding the, the monocytes. So um, I think there's a hint that the, the enrichment in the monocytes um, might be related to malaria itself. Um, uh, we have some evidence um, that uh, those, those same signatures are correlated with um, uh, heme and erythrocytic signatures. So um, being in these malaria endemic areas, malaria is probably the major pathogen of, uh, uh, of, of real clinical significance. Um, uh, and so if you can envision those kids who are constantly exposed to malaria, um, their innate system can be revved up. And so uh, the myeloid cells can be you know, um, enriched. And so one of the questions we're trying to investigate is, is this purely an enrichment or is there actually true activation of these monocytes? And so with the single cell data, we're, we're gonna try to um, delve a little deeper and see if there's differential um, uh, expression of um, uh, innate pathways within the monocytes that are actually enriched. Um, and uh, um, your second question. Um, Wondering about the longitudinal uh, oh, data the longitudinal. of this. Yeah. Oh, so, so what I didn't show you was that um, most of those individuals in the, the Mali eventually got infected in subsequent years. So it's, it's a, it is a short term. And so that's why I was leaning towards it being a very innate process. Um, and uh, whether or not the, the monocytes remain enriched, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to study that because that the 2011 was the, fir the first and only year where we collected uh, RNA um, uh, samples um, uh, basically every two weeks. Um, the subsequent years, we just basically have to recollect um, uh, RNA samples and um, I'm actually part of the, the L9 LS study that's being done in Mali, and we're, we're proposing to do a systems analysis um, on the L9, L9 LS uh, children as well. And so hopefully amongst the placebo arm, um, we will see uh, this re demonstrated of these protected children. And hopefully we can uh, try to replicate uh, what we showed in the 2011 study. And then uh, lastly, the severity question. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because I, it has to do, so adults in general um, tend to respond with much severe symptoms than children. Um, so complete naive. So this was a study done by uh, uh, a group in Papua New Guinea um, uh, led by Dr. Baird. Um, where they observed in um, trans migrants, um, um, I think it was Indonesia as well. So pe people who uh, uh, left um, non-endemic areas to malaria endemic areas, um, they observed that the adults who were malaria naive tend to respond with more severe symptoms um, than the children. And so there, there are hypotheses that um, uh, in adults, potentially uh, due to your multiple pathogen exposures in the past, um, you might uh, develop cross-reactive um, uh, immune processes that when you encounter people's serpent, you have a more severe reaction. So it's, it's actually an interesting uh, way to study. The problem of studying that is it's, it's very hard to study um, at a scale because you, ha you have to get a lot of people going to malaria endemic areas and willing to risk getting malaria to observe that. And so most of the population we study, you know, uh, military, et cetera, travelers, we usually go on prophylaxis 
I'm not willing to, willing to take that risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Makes sense. But thanks. And Dr. Crossan, please. Then next, Dr. Ferrari. Uh, thank you very much. That was a, actually a very important talk. Uh, I have a very simple question. Do, do NK cells play any role in uh, resistance to malaria or is it just the CD8 positive cells? Um, it's a good question for Dr. Hart. Um, Dr. Hart, um, <laughs> he, he's, uh, he's at University of Minnesota, so he's uh, NK cells. Um, uh, what we have found at least in uh, our studies, is there is a relationship in cytotoxic signatures um, uh, across the board, whether or not um, in the KSBZ study, whether or not they're in a placebo group or any of the vaccines group. If they have the kids who are protected against infection have enrichment in cytotoxic um, gene signatures. Um, because we did bulk RNA seq, we're not, not able to deconvolute it to a level where we can actually um, identify whether or not it's NK cells, CD8s, or gamma deltas. So that's one of the problems with using bulk RNA seq. The uh, gene sets that are, are for all of those cytotoxins are very similar, um, and so um, uh, we're, we're hoping with the, at least in the uh, Malian data, since we're using site seq, we're able to. Uh, uh, tease some of that out. Um, but at this point, we're not seeing any NK cells, at least in protection from infection. Uh, Dr. Hart has done some work showing that it correlates with protection from clinical malaria. Um, um, so it's certain subsets of NK cells. Thank you. So, Dr. Ferreri, thank you, Dr. Tran, for a lovely talk. With, uh, with elegant data. My question is whether you have data on the RNA-seq signatures in young children within the same family, similar signatures. It's a, that's a very good question. Um, uh, I would have to go back, um, but the way we did the study, the chances are pretty low. We, we randomized them based on the um, uh, the village census. So um, it would have to be by chance um, that we, we we have to go back, contact the, uh, the mine investigators and figure out if there was a uh, same in the same household and, and hopefully hope that we have actually have the samples for the same household. But um, it is possible to do that. So it's a good question. Um, and you're probably either asking the question of whether or not um, it's related to exposure, people in the same household have the same exposure or uh, potentially the genetics, so. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in the possibility that it's genetically regulated and those studies would be interesting. Um, yeah, it, it would be, and um, uh, it would be an area of investigation. We have the DNA, we just don't have the, uh, uh, the ethical approval to actually do those, those uh, genomic uh, sequencing. Um, I understand. Well, when you see Dr. Chandy John, give him my regards, Pat Ferrari. I will. Thank you. Any other All questions? right. Further questions? If not, we will close up for the day. Thank you, Dr. Tran, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thanks for all of you attending. Yeah, we had over 60 guests this morning. So thank you once again. Have a good day. Bye.